Book One, Chapter One of The Mill on the Floss. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. Book One, Boy and Girl. Chapter One. Outside Dorcoat Mill. A wide plain where the broadening floss hurries on between its green banks to the sea, and the loving tide, rushing to meet it, checks its passage with an impetuous embrace. On this mighty tide, the black ships, laden with the fresh scented fir planks, with rounded sacks of oil bearing seed, or with the dark glitter of coal, are borne along to the town of St. Oaks, which shows its age, fluted red roofs and the broad gables of its walls, between the low wooded hill and the river brink, tinging the water with a soft purple hue under the transient glance of this February sun. Far away on each hand stretch the rich pastures, and the patches of dark earth made ready for the seed of broad-leaved green crops, or touched already with the tint of the tender-bladed autumn-sown corn. There is a remnant still of last year's golden clusters of beehive ricks, rising at intervals beyond the hedgerows, and everywhere the hedgerows are studded with trees. The distant ships seem to be lifting their masts and stretching their red-brown sails close among the branches of the spreading ash. Just by the red-roofed town the tributary ripple flows with a lively current into the floss. How lovely the little river is, with its dark changing wavelets. It seems to me like a living companion while I wander along the bank and listen to its low, placid voice, as to the voice of one who is deaf and loving. I remember those large dipping willows, I remember the stone bridge, and this is Dorcott Mill. I must stand a minute or two here, on the bridge, and look at it, though the clouds are threatening, and it is far on in the afternoon. Even in this leafless time of departing February, it is pleasant to look at. Perhaps the chill, damp season adds a charm to the trimly kept, comfortable dwelling house, as old as the elms and chestnuts that shelter it from the northern blast. The stream is brimful now, and lies high in this little withy plantation, and half drowns the grassy fringe of the croft in front of the house. As I look at the full stream, the vivid grass, the delicate bright green powder softening the outline of the great trunks and branches that gleam from under the bare purple boughs, I am in love with moistness, and envy the white ducks that are dipping their heads far into the water here among the withes, unmindful of the awkward appearance they make in the drier world above. The rush of the water and the booming of the mill bring a dreamy deafness, which seems to heighten the peacefulness of the scene. They are like a great curtain of sound, shutting one out from the world beyond, and now there is the thunder of the huge covered wagon coming home with sacks of grain. That honest wagoner is thinking of his dinner, getting sadly dry in the oven at this late hour but he will not touch it till he has fed his horses, the strong, submissive, meek-eyed beasts, who, I fancy, are looking mild reproach at him from between their blinkers. That he should crack his whip at them, in that awful manner, as if they needed that hint. See how they stretch their shoulders up the slope toward the bridge, with all the more energy because they are so near home. Look at their grand shaggy feet that seem to grasp the firm earth, at the patient strength of their necks, bowed under the heavy collar, at the mighty muscles of their straggling haunches. 
I should like well to hear them neigh over their hardly earned feed of corn, and see them, with their moist necks freed from the harness, dipping their eager nostrils into the muddy pond. Now they are on the bridge, and down they go again at a swifter pace, and the arch of the covered wagon disappears at the turning behind the trees. Now I can turn my eyes toward the mill again, and watch the unresting wheel sending out its diamond jets of water. That little girl is watching it too. She has been standing on just the same spot, at the edge of the water, ever since I paused on the bridge, and that queer white cur with the brown ear seems to be leaping and barking in ineffectual remonstrance with the wheels. Perhaps he is jealous because his playfellow, in the beaver bonnet, is so wrapped in its movement. It is time the little playfellow went in, I think, and there is a bright fire to tempt her. The red light shines out under the deepening grey of the sky. It is time, too, for me to leave off, resting my arms on the cold stone of this bridge. Ah! Uh, my arms are really benumbed. I have been pressing my elbows on the arms of my chair, and dreaming that I was standing on the bridge in front of Dorcott Mill, as it looked one February afternoon many years ago. Before I dozed off, I was going to tell you what Mr. and Mrs. Tulliver were talking about, as they sat by the bright fire in the left-hand parlour. On that very afternoon I have been dreaming of. End of Book One Chapter One